This is your first lecture on the religion of Sanatana Dharma, which is much better known around the world as Hinduism. Okay, first of all, let's just talk about the name Sanatana Dharma because Hinduism is the more popular name for this religion. Sanatana means eternal, and Dharma, which is common to many Eastern religions, uh, is interpreted as a way of life. And so Hindus uh, would describe their religion not just as a set of beliefs or rituals, but as an entire way of life, and it is the everlasting or the eternal way of life. Uh, within uh, Hinduism, we do have polytheism, but it is polytheism grouped together under one divine reality known as Brahman. So Brahman is a very important term for Hindu theology. It can either refer to a non-personal ultimate reality that includes all gods, or it can refer to a specific deity that would be seen in a sense as the uh, father god or the creator god over all of the other gods. And the life view within Sanatana Dharma is that within this physical body, uh, which we're going to see in just a moment, there's some disagreement within Hindu thought about whether this physical body actually exists or whether it's just a facade. But within this physical body, there is this invisible soul or spirit referred to as the Atman. And that Atman, that soul that is within your body, actually belongs to Brahman. And so all of life is about a journey of learning how to let go of the physical body so that your Atman, your soul, can be freed to once again rejoin Brahman. Now, most of you have probably heard the term reincarnation before. The thought within uh, Hinduism is that if you live your life well with good behavior and good ethics toward others, that would be called good karma. And if you have good karma, then when you die, you will be reincarnated. Your Atman will be given a new physical body, and it will be a higher life form. So let's say that you were uh, a servant in a, in a household, but you lived very, very well there would be a good chance that when you die, your Atman's new body would be that of a prince or a king uh, or a queen, some figure of nobility or royalty, and that would be the reward of your good karma. Now, if you live poorly and do not treat others well, that would be bad karma, and then your Atman would be given uh, a reincarnation that would be a lower life form. Um, and again, all of life is seen as having these Atmans, so you could most certainly be reborn uh, not even as a person, but as an animal or uh, some form of vegetation. Now, again, the hope is eventually that your Atman will become so pure that it no longer needs to be reincarnated, that your Atman has learned all of the lessons of life that needed to be learned, and you're now an enlightened person, and you escape the cycle of reincarnation. This cycle of reincarnation is referred to as samsara, which you can see uh, in bold print at the bottom of this slide. And once you finally have your Atman, your soul, freed from this cycle of reincarnation, this cycle of samsara, of going through all of these different life forms, well, once you're finally freed, your Atman is said to be liberated because it's joining Brahman. And that liberation or salvation of the Atman is called moksha, which is the very last term that you have on this slide. So again, moksha is when you escape, when you are liberated from the cycle of samsara. And again, this could be an Atman that has lived thousands, maybe even millions of years before enlightenment is finally attained. And that's certainly the depiction that you have here with an Eastern thought is a fellow participating in yoga, sitting under a tree, and with the sunlight coming through the tree, this is showing us that a moment of enlightenment is, is happening in that very uh, moment. All right. As we look at the uh, philosophical and historical backgrounds of this religious tradition, we need to realize that for uh, the vast majority of years in scholarship, there was a racist a theory that was provided for how this oldest world religion uh, began, and that is Sanatana Dharma is our oldest uh, world religion 
that it still exists today. And this racist theory is referred to as the Aryan Invasion Theory. And uh, within the Academy for so long, we had the idea that uh, white Europeans were uh, so much smarter than uh, everyone else. And eventually the same idea would travel uh, to America, that, that uh, white Americans and white Europeans were more scholarly than uh, people from other racial backgrounds. And because Hinduism was respected as a very wise philosophy and religion, and its writings were very sophisticated, especially philosophically, uh, within scholarship, uh, the, the racist attitude developed that these dark-skinned people of India couldn't have possibly come up with this on their own. And so lighter-skinned people, Aryan people, must have invaded the Indus River Valley in northwest India and brought this religion to them. Uh, there, there really isn't uh, evidence uh, for that. There certainly is evidence that there was a migration of lighter skinned people at some point, uh, but the teachings of Sanatana Dharma, the teachings of Hinduism, were already well rooted in that area. And when these lighter skinned Aryans returned home, they actually took what they learned from the darker skinned people of India. Uh, back to their homes with them. And that appears to be the much more uh, accurate theory that uh, within the Indus River Valley, you had several different uh, Indian people uh, coming to that very fertile area. And as they came together from many different areas uh, throughout the subcontinent of India, they exchanged their ideas. And uh, 3,000 uh, years ago, this very uh, significant, vital world religion began to grow out of that conversation among different Indian peoples. Um, this is also referred to, uh, Sanatana Dharma, as a Vedic religion because it's based upon a collection of holy scripture called the Vedas, and we'll say more about them on the next slide. And uh, we also need to realize, this is probably one of the most difficult concepts within Hinduism, that not all Hindus agree with one another. And it's true of every religion. Uh, you can find two people that belong to the same religion. They can have some very different ideas. So uh, one philosophy within Sanatana Dharma is called the Samkhya philosophy. You see that listed on the last bullet. And the Samkhya is dualistic. And what I mean by dualistic is that there is belief that the physical body does actually exist and the Atman is trapped in it. And again, the hope is that through practicing Sanatana Dharma, you learn to shed off this very real physical body and the Atman is finally released to be part of Brahman. Now, the uh, uh, Samkhya is the oldest philosophy within the Hindu tradition, but the majority of Hindus today follow the newer philosophy, which is Advaita Vedanta. So the very last two words on this slide. And Advaita Vedanta teaches that this physical body that we think we have is actually just an illusion, a fa facade, that this doesn't even really exist, that uh, our Atmans have been tricked into believing that this material, physical world actually exists and what it's done is actually trap us when what we need to see is, is that this is uh, to come to a point of enlightenment to see that th none of this is even real. Um, I know this is an oversimplification, but if any of you have seen uh, the Matrix movies, it's the same basic idea that um, the computer program causes uh, Neo and other characters within that movie uh, to think that the fake world they're in is the real world and they need to be awakened from that to see uh, what is what has actually become of the real world. And so, sorry, if you haven't seen those movies, that illustration doesn't help you any. Uh, but for those of you who have seen the Matrix movie, it's the same idea here that you need to be awakened out of this sleep of thinking this world is real and then you can become enlightened and in so doing your Atman then joins Brahma which is that divine ultimate reality. Uh, by the way the picture that you have here ties in with that first writing assignment that's now available for you. Uh, this is Krishna visiting with Arjuna and of course their conversation that they're having here at the chariot uh, is what your writing assignment uh, is about. Hope you've had a chance to take a look at Okay, the uh, holy scripture within the Sanatana Dharma tradition is called the Vedas. I mentioned that on the previous slide. And uh, there are four volumes of holy scripture uh, within Sanatana Dharma. And uh, the four Vedas were the writings of very wise people called Rishis. 
and all of the writings of the Rishis were eventually gathered together and edited and uh, organized in these four Vedas. Now the name of the editor is Vyasa and while some people think Vyasa was an individual who put all of the writings of the Rishis together, most Hindu scholars today believe that Vyasa was much more likely a collection of scholars who had collected the writings of the Rishis and put them together. And there are some uh, different types of literature, some different genres of literature that you have uh, within the Vedas. Um, but by the way, one thing to please have in your notes here, you don't need to know the name of all four volumes of the Vedas, but I do want you to know the name of the oldest volume because it would be the oldest collection of sacred scripture for all world religions. Okay, so the name of the very oldest Veda is the Rig Veda, two words, R-I-G and then V-E-D-A, the Rig Veda. And again, that's not just for Sanatana Dharma, for all world religions. If you were to take all of the Holy Scripture within all of those religions, the Rig Veda would be the oldest uh, of, of the Holy Scriptures. Okay, now I just mentioned that there are uh, four different genres of literature. So let me just cover that briefly. These are the, the four types of literature listed in italics here for you. Uh, Samhitas, or songs or poems. And uh, these are offered to a god or goddess as a way of, of thanksgiving. And uh, the other three are mentioned in your textbook. I, I believe your author left out Samhitas. I'm, I'm not sure why. I may be mistaken. Maybe she did mention them, but I think, I think that she left that out. So do make sure you have Samhitas down. Samhitas, songs or poems that are offered to the god or goddess. And then Brahmanas, uh, these are instructions for how you perform religious rituals correctly. Um, so perhaps uh, one way you worship in Sanatana Dharma is that you make a meal for the god or goddess. And so the Brahmana literature would instruct you on the recipe on how to make that meal. And then uh, one thing that you're going to hear more about in the uh, second lecture on Sanatana Dharma is about the, the very old, aged Hindu hermits who, if they did have possessions at some point in their life, they leave everything behind and live out in the wilderness, live out in the forest. And we have some of their writings that are the uh, thoughts that come to them during their times of meditation uh, as they are out in the forest or wilderness. And this literature is the third type you have here, the Aranyakas. And then fourth and finally, the most well-known type of literature uh, in the Vedas, the Upanishads. And the Upanishads are the very weighty philosophical writings. So the greatest teachers, the greatest gurus within the tradition of Sanatana Dharma, uh, this is their very complex and oftentimes quite complicated uh, philosophical teachings of this tradition. Okay, one of the primary disciplines or practices within Sanatana Dharma is yoga. Uh, and So we've talked about the word moksha already, that is when your Atman is liberated and so yoga is the practice that you would have for your journey into moksha, your journey into liberation. Now there are four basic schools of yoga and these four different schools of yoga are designed to address different personality types. Uh, the first two uh, deal with meditation and that's what the fellow depicted here is doing. He's uh, sitting uh, with his posture and you can see how uh, straight and vertical his spine is. The belief is that at the base of the spine uh, you have your spiritual energy, sometimes referred to as sh uh, energy forces called chakras, and the hope is that through meditation uh, your mind will become so quiet that the chakras will travel from the base of your spine all the way up your back into your neck and then finally into your mind. And Oftentimes you will see the picture of one meditating uh, that that individual will have an enormous lotus flower uh, uh, blossoming behind his head and the idea being the lotus flower represents that enlightenment has taken place. The chakras have traveled all the way up to his mind and the enlightenment is represented by the blossoming of that lotus flower uh, behind his head. Now this fellow doesn't have the lotus flower behind his head so he's still waiting uh, for his enlightenment to take place. Uh, the first two schools, again, have to deal with uh, meditation and thinking, and that's uh, Raja Yoga and Yana Yoga. 
uh, Raja Yoga consists of trying to quiet the mind so much that you cease to have that continuing process of thought after thought after thought racing through your mind. That may sound simple to many of you, but take a moment to think how difficult that is. I mean, see if you can stop yourself from thinking, and if you can, see how long you can do that. Uh, we tend to be creatures who will obsess over uh, what happened yesterday that upset us or even made us really happy. Or we may be anxious about something that we know is going to happen later in the day or later in the week. And so we uh, really are almost constantly thinking about what happened or what will happen. And it is very difficult for us to simply be in the present moment and to stop that constant conversation of thoughts uh, running through our minds. So that's Raja Yoga of uh, sitting very still and maybe even uh, having a, a sound or a mantra that you would repeat over and over to try to quiet the mind. And uh, the second form of meditation uh, for yoga is called Yana Yoga. And yana yoga primarily consists of a very simple question that has a very difficult answer. Uh, yana yoga asks you the question, who am I? Or really, for you, who are you? So if you were doing yana yoga, you would ask that question of yourself. Who am I? And you, your first instinct might be to say your name. And yana yoga would say, well, no, no, that's not who you are. That's just a label. That's just a name that's been put upon you. Who are you? So then you, you might try to respond by what you're, you do for a living, what your job is. And Yana Yoga would say, no, no, that, that's not who you are. That, that's what you do. And so you, 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 know, you may try to go to another layer and say, well, I'm the brother of so-and-so or the sister of so-and-so, the father, the mother of this person, the child of this person. They'd say, no, 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 it's just relationships within your life. But who, who are you? And I, I hope you're starting to hear who am I becomes a very difficult question to answer and so yana yoga is having you peel back layer after layer after layer of all of these things that you have mistaken as your identity to see if you can finally come to a truer understanding of your identity. Uh, now we change completely when we come to karma yoga. Karma yoga is by far the simplest of these four schools. Uh, karma yoga is for the personality type that doesn't live so much maybe in the world of the mind, but is uh, uh, busy in the world doing things, especially doing things for other people. And so that's where the word karma comes in. Uh, karma yoga is the practice of being very observant of identifying the needs that other people have and trying to do all that you can to meet those needs. And by doing that, you build up good karma and you will hopefully be in re reincarnated as a higher being. Now, if you do a very poor job of practicing uh, karma yoga, this means that you're a very selfish and uh, self-centered person and you do not look for the needs of others and therefore you would have bad karma and be uh, reincarnated as a lower life form. But far and away, for most Hindu people, the most common form of yoga is this final one here, bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga consists of showing emotional, even romantic love toward a god or goddess. And so either you as an individual, or within your family, or most commonly within your village, you have selected one of the goddesses or one of the gods and you express your love and devotion to this god. Now it may be a picture of the god that you have in a shrine in the center of your village. It may be a statue of the god or goddess that you have in your own home. But you would bring flowers to this god or goddess. You would recite a love poem uh, to the deity. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you maybe would make a meal and bring it uh, to the god. And so that's what bhakti yoga is, showing that sort of emotional, uh, ro even romantic devotion to the god. Now the, the goal of the two forms of mental yoga, raja and jnana, is samadhi, which is just another word for enlightenment, that as you ask that question, who am I? Or as you try to quiet the mind down, you would have that lotus flower blossoming uh, uh, out of the head experience, that enlightenment has taken place. And certainly you could uh, mention that bhakti was the most popular, and I think you could easily hear that karma was the most practical as you try to help other people with their needs.
Okay, well let's continue with bhakti yoga for a bit since that is the most popular form. Again, this is showing your devotion uh, to a god and uh, one way that you celebrate that devotion is that there are volumes and volumes of stories uh, that are told about these gods. Uh, certainly many of them are in the Vedas, but some of them are, are outside of the Vedas. But as you have these stories about the god or goddess, it would help you and your community feel that you know the god personally, and you certainly know the god better and better over time. And this is a way of expressing devotion. There are three primary paths uh, in the bhakti yoga tradition. Uh, the first, the sakta school, is when you choose one of the goddesses and you show your devotion to her. And again, I mentioned those forms of devotion uh, earlier, so I won't go over all that again, but I will give you a couple of examples. Uh, not pictured on this slide is the goddess Durga. Durga has a beautiful, sensual face, very attractive. And then as you move down her body, you see that she has several pairs of arms and all of these hands at the end of the arms are holding weaponry. And she uh, rides around on a lion or a tiger. And uh, what she does is in the beauty of her face assures you that you are loved and she will comfort you. But with all of the swords and daggers that she holds in her hands and on the fierce beast that she rides upon, she's also promising to protect you that if anyone threatens you, uh, she will attack them uh, to take care of you. Now, a second goddess that I'll mention is Kali, and she is pictured here at the top right. Uh, she is a very fierce goddess. You can see that she holds uh, a severed head in one hand, and she's got her foot up on an enemy that she's defeated. Uh, normally, she's pictured with a girdle or a belt around her that is full of severed heads. And uh, she is seen as a very violent goddess, but if you show your devotion to her, her violence will not be visited upon you. Uh, but just like Durja, her violence will be against those who oppose you, against your enemies. Okay, um, let's move on to uh, the next school within Bhakti Yoga, which is the Saivites. And uh, the Saivites worship the god Shiva, uh, pictured here in the middle. And Shiva is seen as the god of destruction. Okay, the god of destruction. And then the last school is called the Vaishnavites, and they worship the god Vishnu. And Vishnu is the god of preservation, okay, the god of preservation, the god who sustains the creation. Now, here's a really important thing to get down in your notes. I mentioned at the very beginning of this lecture that Brahman could be seen as an impersonal divine reality that includes all of the gods, or Brahma can be looked at as an individual God who is the creator or father God of all the others. So there are three gods that stand out in the Hindu tradition more so than there are thousands of counterparts. Number one is Brahman as the creator God. Number two is Vishnu as the sustaining God or the God of preservation. And number three is Shiva, or Siva, and he is the god of destruction. And what you have with all three of these together is the cycle of life repeating itself over and over and over again. And that sort of cyclical repetition within creation is very important to Hindu tradition. It's not that you look so much for an end of the story, but you look for a way to express continuation and repetition. So what do we have? A creator God, and then we have a sustaining or preserving God, and then we have a God who destroys, and not in a bad way, because the destruction is necessary for Brahma to create all over again. So all three of these functions are seen as good and necessary. Brahma creates... Vishnu preserves the creation, Shiva destroys the creation, and Brahma creates again. Okay, I think that that will be sufficient for this slide. Okay, uh, we talked some about uh, the bhakti yoga approach, having some literature, some stories. And these stories are about when the gods, uh, and, and Vishnu more than any other, uh, does this. But... When the gods choose to put on flesh, when the gods choose to become incarnate, 
uh, become a, a physical figure that others in the world can see. And so uh, the gods, such as Vishnu, love us so much that within Hindu tradition, they have divine visitations. They come down to see us. Now, you saw a great example of that on an earlier slide. You saw the figure with blue uh, skin. Okay, That was uh, Krishna, who is an incarnation of Vishnu. Okay, So when Vishnu, the god, decides to become incarnate, decides to become a person, he most often does so as Krishna, and then sometimes he does so as another figure named Rama. Okay, and so the, the Ramayana tells us a story about Vishnu becoming incarnate. And you've got that story in your textbook. And then the Mahabharata is another a story within the Mahabharata. You had the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, it is an excerpt from the Bhagavad Gita that you are reading for that first writing assignment. Okay, and uh, pictured here on this slide is Hanuman, and uh, Hanuman is a monkey warrior, and uh, this is also common within uh, Hindu stories that animals have personalities, and, and animals speak out loud, and uh, animals and humans can understand one another, and they can work together with one another, or they can be opposed to one another, but that's an extremely important element of bhakti literature that uh, animals, such as Hanuman the monkey warrior, actually communicate and work with uh, human beings. And in, in this case, Hanuman uh, works for the incarnation of Vishnu as Rama uh, in this story, the Ramayana. And then, of course, these stories are written as prose, uh, but we also have uh, poetry that tells a story. And uh, the more poetic form of bhakti literature, referred to as Purana. And uh, the Bhagavata Purana is a great little story about Vishnu becoming incarnate as uh, Krishna and uh, all of the girls in the little village uh, where he has visited because he becomes incarnate as a teenage boy. They all fall in love with him and uh, here they are having a little festival and he's dancing with one of the girls and all the other girls become very jealous and so uh, Krishna decides that the um, selfless thing to do is to just to replicate himself, to clone himself over and over and over again. So suddenly every single girl at the party has her own Krishna uh, to dance with and everyone's happy. And then just as, as suddenly and strangely as he had appeared, he disappears and all the girls are broken hearted to have lost their Krishna. But what has happened, the point of the story, is that what has happened is by his visitation, they have learned to love him and long after him. And so now their lives will continue to be in the path of bhakti yoga, of longing for, yearning for the return of Krishna. Okay, and then we'll uh, conclude this lecture by looking at some of the holy days of Sanatana Dharma. Uh, you do not have to uh, know all of these listed here. Every semester I pick out a few different ones to emphasize. So uh, let me just go ahead and uh, I'm going to make the selection right now over which ones you're responsible for. Um, let's go ahead and do the first one, Lohari. Uh, Lohari, is an, it's similar to a, a, a New Year's a day it uh, you would have a, a fire built a bonfire built and you would uh, take things that would make loud noises when you throw them into a fire a popcorn is a, a well-known one sometimes even little packets of gunpowder will be rolled together and uh, thrown into this fire and when the loud noise is made it's understanding that you have thrown off some of the bad things about you, even some of your bad karma, and with the loud pop in the fire, it has been forever removed from you, and the noise signifies that the gods have placed something new and good, a blessing upon you. And so Lohari is a way of throwing off the bad and welcoming uh, the good. Um, holy is uh, um, saying goodbye to winter and welcome to the spring season, but I'm not going to make you... Uh, know that one this time, but just if you're curious, that's what holy is. Um, tell you what, here's an easy one, Naga Panchami. Uh, I have an enormous phobia of snakes. I can't stand snakes, but within the Hindu tradition, snakes are seen as especially sacred. I know a lot of you have seen documentaries or movies where you have uh, someone who is uh, taming the cobra, charming the cobra, and Naga Panchami is the day of showing reverence uh, to snakes. 
Okay, and then um, let's go ahead and have you know about John Mashtami because we have a picture of that here. John Mashtami is the celebration of Krishna's birthday. And uh, little boys will dress up like Krishna as a way of celebrating the day of that great God's birth. And remember, uh, Krishna is the same as Vishnu. The only difference is when Vishnu is in Brahman in the heavens, uh, he is uh, an invisible deity. But when he chooses to become visible and be seen by people, he is Krishna and then sometimes Rama. But Krishna is the more uh, um, well-known incarnation. Uh, so you don't need to know about Ganesh Turti, but I do hope that in your reading you came across that really uh, bizarre event about Ganesh uh, that has, um, to this day, still has no explanation. But uh, it is very, very well documented on September 21st, 1995, uh, when people went to worship Ganesh. If you've never seen him before, Ganesh is the god who has the head of an elephant. It's a very interesting story on how he got that head, but we we don't have time to, to get into that right now. Uh, but Ganesh is the son of Shiva and uh, has this elephant head, and many people worship Ganesh. And one way of worshiping Ganesh is to bring him uh, milk to drink. And of course, normally, because it's a stone statue, you put the milk up to the, uh, you know, to the lips for Ganesh to drink, and the milk would simply uh, go down uh, the stone and uh, you know, eventually to the ground and uh, evaporate over time. But on that one day, September 21st, 1995, all throughout the subcontinent of India, these stone statues of Ganesh actually absorbed the milk, took the milk in. You know, scientists were wondering if the stone with the weather or climate, if there was just some particular way that it was porous, but it, it's still so bizarre and avoids uh, any real scientific explanation because it began at dawn that day, September 21st, and it ceased to happen at sunset that day, and it has not happened again. And it, again, it was all throughout India. So anyway, uh, Ganesh Chaturthi is a holy day uh, uh, that is focused upon this god Ganesh, but that's not one that you have to know this time around. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just skip down to the very bottom for the last one you need to know about uh, because we do have uh, the picture here of Kumbh Mela. And Kumbh Mela is a day of gathering together. It's actually not just a day. It's a season gathering together at four particular sacred holy spots uh, at rivers throughout India. And it's not even uh, every year that they do this. Uh, on some calendars, it's been every three years. Sometimes it's every four years. But at Kumbh Mela, you go into the river and all different caste of people, from those who are considered very sophisticated, wealthy, and educated, to those who are very, very poor and have no shelter at all, they they forget the caste system on this one day and they all come together and everyone goes into the river to bathe and it's seen as this sacred holy spot and it is not just a washing of the physical body of course but more symbolically it is a way of trying to purify the Atman so that you hasten your journey toward moksha, toward liberation. Um, one last thing before I uh, close this lecture. Uh, of all holy days in every single religious tradition, there has never been as large a gathering for a holy event than Kumbh Mela. And it was in 2001. They recorded over 25 million people. Uh, that particular year the, of the four spots, it was the Jumna River. And 25 million people uh, over 25 million uh, gathered uh, over the days of Kumbh Mela uh, at that spot to bathe in that river. So again, uh, not uh, not a Christian, not a, a Muslim, because uh, you would certainly think maybe the Hajj, the pilgrimage uh, to Mecca, which has uh, over a million people oftentimes. You would think one of those other events perhaps would be the largest religious gathering ever, but no, it was Kumbh Mela in the year 2001. All right, well, I will put up the second lecture on Sanatana Dharma on Thursday or Friday this week, and I will have an announcement on Blackboard uh, whenever that is done. I hope you are doing well.